Welcome to First Trinity Unity Community Church of the United States. How can we feed you today? Hi, I'd like a 25-minute sermon and some upbeat worship music, please. Nothing too crazy, though. And I don't like to stand until the very end. Certainly. Please drive forward. Have a blessed day. No standing until the end, right? Of course not, sir. Here at FT. CCUSA. We get your order right the first time, every time, all the time, and on time until the end of time. Have a blessed day. Welcome to First Trinity Unity Community Church of the United States. How can we feed you today? Who's teaching? Pastor Wilkes. No, I'm not so crazy about him. Oh, uh, I meant uh, Pastor Johnson, of course. Sorry for the mix-up. That's more like it. Now look, I don't want any of that Old Testament business today. I want to focus on the New Testament. Well, of course, sir. The Old Testament God is me. I mean, he is a lot happier now, so let's focus on the present. Certainly. I want some creative illustrations. I want to laugh a little bit, but not too much. I want my communion crackers broken for me with 100% <laughs> with 100% natural grape juice. I know that stuff last week was from Ken. You think that's honoring to God? No, sir, of course not. I didn't think so. And I want to feel encouraged and uplifted and affirmed this week. And look, I want some healing for my bunion. And I don't want to be challenged too much, just a little bit, okay? Because I'm challenged enough during the work. Certainly. This is a safe place. A happy place. And I'd be a lot happier if you had, if you had something in the fifth row or so. Certainly. That's what I'm talking about. Hi, I'm Andrew Strom, author of the new 2015 edition of Kundalini Warning, a false spirits invading the church. And the main reason we've put out this new version of the book is because of Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Redding, California. Now there's no doubt that Bill Johnson is one of the most influential figures in the charismatic world today. But what really concerns us is what's going on behind the scenes at Bethel. Uh, this is what a bunch of drunk really Bethel nice. students look like. <laughs> All of this footage comes from within Bethel itself. Obviously, as you can see, they're into spreading this drunkenness anointing, just like the others we've looked at. For years, Bill's wife, Benny Johnson, has been the senior co-pastor of Bethel alongside her husband. And this woman is into some truly weird new agey stuff, reflexology, and much more. Benny Johnson herself put out this picture She's lying, soaking on C.S. Lewis's grave. These are students from Bethel's School of Ministry, and they've been photographed around the world lying on the graves of dead Christian leaders. There's a teaching in some of these circles that you can soak up the anointing by lying on their graves. Here's Bill Johnson himself at the grave of the wife of Smith Wigglesworth the famous healing evangelist. Of course, people say that Bill Johnson is such a great teacher, such a great writer, but it's actually what's going on in the background that concerns us, the spreading of New Age practices, the spreading of a New Age type anointing, a foreign spirit. Those are the things that really worry us about Bethel. In 2012, the Bethel crowd put out this book, the Physics of Heaven, and the subtitle says it all. Exploring God's mysteries of sound, light, energy, vibrations, and quantum physics. Many Christian leaders, when they've read this book, say it is one of the most New Age things they've ever seen. The contents are unbelievable. Just the chapter headings alone are proof enough. Vibrating in harmony with God. The God vibration. Dolphin therapy, quantum mysticism, human body frequencies. What on earth is a major ministry like Bethel doing promoting such a weird and mystical work? 
Of course, this deeply New Age book is still sold on the Bethel website to this day. After all, that's who it's come from. There will be more on all this, a lot more, in our upcoming YouTube video, the fourth in the main series, Kundalini Warning. Amongst other things, we'll be looking at how Bethel has spread its influence to millions and millions of young Christians around the world. My own eyes. So look out for shocking documentary number four, Kundalini Warning, coming soon on YouTube. that I have forwarded the video to a particular point, I want you to make sure that you pay attention to this particular instrument that is about to start and what it might do to the audience. So as you can hear, that synth is very repetitive. It has a hypnotic quality to it. I don't know whether that was on purpose or whether that was just chosen. It probably isn't doing something good in the atmosphere. Have a look out into the congregation. The lights are off. It's complete darkness. The musicians in the stage are lit up and exalted. However, the congregation, if you were standing in that congregation, you wouldn't feel as if you were part of a body of Christ, as if you would feel you were unified with other brethren. You wouldn't even be able to see other people's faces on the other side of the, of the church. It is in darkness and they do that specifically so that you are focused on your subjective encounter, your subjective experience or what's happening on stage and nothing to do with God. The atmosphere is changing now <laughs> For the Spirit of the Lord is here the whole premise of the song is summed up in the first breath of the song, the atmosphere. This church and many churches are all about the atmosphere. It starts the song by saying, the atmosphere is changing now, for the Spirit of the Lord is here. Let me get this straight for you, that this song is not a worship song. And I hope that this wasn't the first song that they sung for the worship service. It does not address God. It doesn't worship, edify, glorify, or honor God in any way. It doesn't come into God's courts with praise and thanksgiving like he is worthy of. This part of the song is very disappointing. To come into the presence of God with very little glorifying of his name or coming the appropriate way, and you have the audacity to give him instructions to, in quote, overflow in this place and surround everybody with your love is just astonishing. The theology of this song is actually a very weak view of God's love. The song is insinuating that God's love is something that you can conjure through a song and that it fills the atmosphere as if it was some sort of chemical element that is on the external of the body and you've got to sort of ask God to, to fill you up as if you're filling a car every time with God's love. This is a weak view of God's love and it isn't a depiction correctly of God's love in, in any respect at all. If the shallowness of the song wasn't already apparent, this next part is the icing on the cake. It is so straightforward. It tells you why they're there. You're the reason we came, not to worship you, not to learn about you in the word, not to glorify you, 
but to encounter your love. What does that even mean? The whole reason why the congregation is there is summed up in one sentence. We came to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. The love that they're referring to is a subjective experience that is induced by a production of light, chord progressions, sounds, instruments, and just the overall vibe of other people there in that atmosphere reacting and, and, and experiencing the same thing that another person is experiencing. An apostate church wants nothing to do with visions or prophecies of men of righteousness. They don't want anything to do with it. You know that's the gospel. You know that's the truth. They want to hear messages. They, they want nothing that disturbs the status quo, nothing to upset this successful world in which they move and live. They refuse any kind of correction. Everything today is being excused under the banner of love. Love. We're getting ready to love the devil. This is a perverted love. I want nothing to do with it. It's all crusades. It has nothing to do with this book. People clamor for entertainment. They flock by the thousands now to concerts and plays and social gatherings while they ridicule the prophets. They mock what they call the doomsday preachers and they prefer the illusions. They don't want any preacher or evangelist to tell them the hard truth and they don't want the, the sword of the Lord to come forth in their congregations. They say, preach to us smooth things. Bless us, make us happy, make us feel good. I heard a preacher say, you come to this church and feel good. God help us. They say, no more preaching of this Holy One of Israel. Jeremiah was sent to prophesy against the apostate Jews, the Lord's own people. You know what God said to Jeremiah? He, he said, I send you forth with my word of judgment and holiness and righteousness, but they will fight you. The dread of the Lord is no longer in them. They prefer to drink from cisterns rather than the living water. You go to Jeremiah 1, 2, 3 and you'll find it. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. No turn it now, but you'll find that old thing there. God sent He said, go, preach to them. But your preaching is going to make their eyes hard. You're going to make them insensitive to the truth. And I'll tell you what, when the word of God comes forth in its power and unction, it'll do one of two things. It'll either break you or harden you. It'll break you or harden you. It'll judge you. The word will judge you or break you. An apostate church simply endures the prophetic voice. They pass it by with a condescending smile. I'm going to read to you. Listen to Ezekiel 33. Don't turn me, just listen to it. He said, they come to you as my people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they don't do it. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their own gain and their idols. And behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. And they hear your words, but they do not practice them. And I can quote a hundred scriptures against this kind of idolatry. And, and, and people will come up and pat me on the back and say, good preaching, brother, if I believe it, and go right back that very night and sit and watch filth. And it's kind of an amusing message. It's kind of a novel thing to hear someone prophesy now. What's it going to be for you, brother, sister? Is it going to be that you hear the prophetic word of the Lord come and then you walk out and sing a sweet, sensual song and go right back and do the same very thing? Many church leaders who say we need to reinvent Christianity to reach out to what's called the postmodern generation. The core premise of postmodern philosophy is the idea that truth is subjective and therefore relative. All well, the emerging faith is subjectivism. It's uh, denial of absolute truth. And so everybody can 
have their own truth and we can all come together in unity. Within the emergent church, because they have thrown out the idea of absolute objective truth, the idea that we can open up God's word and discern his timeless universal truth to humanity, what has happened is they've basically exchanged a rational Christianity for a irrational Christianity, which is based on human subjective experiences and human subjective emotional experiences. The ancient future movement is also part of what's called the emerging church. The view is, is that traditional Christianity is too legalistic, too dry. The seeker-friendly movement is too superficial, too entertainment-oriented. People from emerging generations, those under 35, want a more profound encounter with God. One aspect of appealing to the postmodern generation is to introduce techniques, spirituality, litanies, rituals, and so on. This is called vintage Christianity or ancient future Christianity. Let's go back to the disciplines of the monks. Let's introduce some of the ideas of the East from yoga. Yoga, 2,000-year-old pagan religious philosophy, which is now widespread throughout the emergent church movement. Never see Jesus talking about walking prayer labyrinths, teaching his disciples to practice yoga, practice contemplative prayer. These are all things that don't come from biblical Christianity at all, but are being embraced by the emergent church today because they're looking for some kind of subjective, personal encounter with the divine. And so they say that if we can find these kinds of things in other religions, let's borrow these things from other religions and just call them Christian. For those uh, who profess to be a part of the evangelical church, they're now introducing prayer altars, prayer labyrinths, uh, techniques, bells, incense, candles, all of these things that have a very sensual seduction, but they are not biblical. Many people who are seeking after an experience to participate in Christianity are not interested in studying the Word of God. They say that you know teaching the Bible word by word or verse by verse, that just doesn't work today. What you need is the experiences that you need to be able to smell God, taste God, feel God, touch God. Years ago, Psychology Today said that the Eastern worldview, Eastern religions would come to the West as a psychology. Psychology is not science, it is experiential. It has to do with feelings and moods and understanding. It also teaches uh, bottom line that we are innately good. This is an idea out of Hinduism. Christ in New Age terms is a state of being rather than a person. It means someone who is in touch with their higher self or their true self. They see Jesus as someone who came to show us our divinity. But this was God in the occultic sense. This was not the Judeo-Christian God. This was a God that resonated with the Hindu and Buddhist concepts of God, a God that you could have mystical experiences with, the God that you could embrace through uh, meditative practices, New Age spirituality. The concept of the divine in all is now considered to be quite normal, whereas before it was considered to be blasphemous. Contemplative prayer, also known as centering prayer, is where we can come to the fuller understanding of the unity of all that is. Well, these are classic Hindu concepts, you know, all is one, unity of all that is. In other words, there's no such thing as good or evil or the kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan, that all is one, everything is united. The practice of contemplative prayer is in mystical tradition, which goes back centuries and can be traced back to a group called the Desert Fathers. It's presented as the way to know God at a deeper level. The centering prayer was where one goes into the silence, one takes a Christian word and says it over and over again, and you go into altered states of consciousness and you actually come out with the same mindset as people who are doing yoga. These ideas take people away from the Word of God towards mystical experiences, and these experiences are exactly the kinds of things that are practiced in the East by those who promote Eastern mysticism. Contemplative spirituality is a belief that I can look within. It's a very subjective and experiential technique for finding truth, but not based on the Word of God based on somebody's feelings and experience. And what we have to understand is that in a mystical way of approaching God, it's all subjective. It's all what, what you hear in your altered states of consciousness. Christians have to base our faith on what the Bible says. Christians have to have faith in the Word. Non-Christians have to hear the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God.
One of the major ideas of the purpose-driven movement is that the world can be transformed by working together for the cause of good, to bring a social change on planet Earth, to eradicate AIDS, poverty, illiteracy, and other major problems that the world faces. Rick Warren, in the purpose-driven movement, is going to reform the church. So he says, his idea is that we're going to change what the church does. Using modern marketing techniques and business management techniques, Rick Warren has a program called the Peace Plan. Rather than going forth and preaching the gospel authoritatively, calling people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins, and to uh, serve Him. Jesus clearly told us that the end was coming, and that as the end drew near, we would see more and more chaos, confusion, catastrophe in our world. And this is why, as Christians, we need to keep the gospel at the forefront, which is the eternal heart condition of men and women. The peace plan is we're going to go out and solve the world's problems, cooperating with the other world religions. Rick Warren, he even says that the man of peace who could help you in a village can be a, a Muslim. Can you work with Muslims? Can you work with Hindus and bring this all together as one global faith? Biblical Christians believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He came once, paid the penalty for our sins. He's coming again. We look for his return. Other religions have messianic ideas. They believe that someone is going to come and solve the problems of the world. For example, in Islam, the 12th Imam who is going to come and deal with all the kinds of issues that, that are problematic today. Within Hinduism, they're looking for an avatar, looking for another incarnation. In Tibetan Buddhism, another Dalai Lama. The problem is, is that these are false messiahs, and the only one who's going to fit their definition, their view, is the Antichrist. The emergent church really believe that we can eliminate poverty, we can save the environment, we can uh, end racism and genocide and all the social ills in the world. And that is the gospel for the emergent church. This is an ecumenical idea. Ecumenism meaning that, um, uh, that all religions have a part to play in solving the problems that we see around the world. The Roman Catholic Church is really the catalyst for the ecumenical movement today. It's building bridges into all Christian denominations and that's what ecumenism is. It's an attempt to unite all of Christianity. There's been a great influence by the Roman Catholic religion. Their eschatology says that Jesus Christ will not return until the whole world is Roman Catholic. And so they have an ambition to unite all of Christianity under the power and influence of the Pope. Prophecy tells us that there will be an apostate form of Christianity. And we see that there's two streams of Christianity operating side by side for the last 2,000 years. You have the apostolic church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ that follows the teachings of the apostles. And then you have the apostate church operating right along with it and those are following doctrines of demons. It's a false brand of Christianity. There is a new gospel being promoted today by the emergent church. There are many church leaders who say we need to reinvent Christianity. These popular movements are creating alternatives to biblical Christianity. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few are those who are on that path. But wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those that travel that path. God despises syncretism, taking the practices of ancient pagan religions and thinking you can sanctify it to honor God. And yet Tilden Edwards, the head of the Shalem Institute in Washington, one of the most prominent contemplative training centers in the country, has said, what makes a practice Christian or not Christian isn't its source, it's its intent. So what Tilden Edwards, along with many others in the emergent and contemplative movement are saying, is that we can embrace these practices, these principles, these teachings from ancient pagan mystery religions, sanctify them by sprinkling Christian terminology if our intent is to honor God with it, then by definition they assume God will accept it and be pleased with it, not according to the Word of God. 
the word of God says they are bringing strange fire into the church. The term New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. So they call it new spirituality. But in the church, we find it in many different forms. The emerging movement, the positive confession movement, the word faith movement, the contemplative movement, the uh, new apostolic reformation. So basically, it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. We have a very clever adversary who knows how to redefine and reinvent the Christian faith. And that's what we're watching happen right before our very eyes. In the world religions, there's always been this, uh, this fascination with the mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. Now, we have that all the way back within Christianity through the Gnostics and then through the, the Desert Fathers and, and the Middle Ages and, and uh, a lot of the mysticism that came through Catholicism. But those things were kind of more out on the margins. Uh, they were only in, in particular groups of people within denominations. What we're finding now is that that is hitting the mainstream of Christianity. Barbara Marx Hubbard, probably the almost the, the matriarch of today's contemporary New Age movement, has a book called Emergence, the shift from ego to essence, 10 steps to the universal human. David Spangler, father of the New Age, called the shaman of the New Age, has a book called Emergence, the rebirth of the sacred, the God within. The book As Above, So Below, written by the editors of New Age magazine, talk about the emergent spirituality. And they talk all about contemplative prayer and esoteric Christianity. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. He discovered that these practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. Thomas Keating popularized the movement called centering, where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit, through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And actually, Thomas Keating has acknowledged that that practice of contemplative meditation, even in its Christianized version, is identical to the Eastern meditation and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the kundalini demonic force to rise up even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. One thing that, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. We are being told, not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but by many who are now in leadership, that we need to have spiritual experiences for an authentic faith. As far as Christianity is concerned, the corruption is coming into the church from outside. We're embracing those things that God speaks nothing of in Scripture unless He's speaking against it. And a lot of Christian leaders are really devaluing the Bible. And that's really very common in the, in the merging, emerging new spirituality church. The Bible is really reliable, and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups, Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses, 
who's helped develop many programs. He was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church. It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community, and by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up, not surprisingly, by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective, where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, talking about God's dream. Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream, and both the New Age and the church, Erwin McManus used the term, uses the term God's dream. It's a metaphor for the coming world peace. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government, which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion, and it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one world government, a one world religion, which would bring a utopia on earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like the idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, it, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became, in the 1940s and 50s, the Latter Rain Movement. An offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God, and part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham. One of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God, we were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Unless you are looking to the word of God, you have no way of testing what these prophets who are coming predicting and prophesying in the name of God are saying to you. Sadly, we do know that, uh, that the world itself will turn its back on Israel in the latter days. Uh, we see the, the, um, the nuts and bolts being put together right now, the nations that are arraying themselves against Israel, they're all in place right now as we speak. Anybody who takes the Bible seriously and what it teaches will always see Israel as the apple of God's eye and do everything to their last drop of blood to defend them. Jerusalem, it's the seat of worship and it'll be the place where uh, when God restores all things to their, their former self, the church needs to be aware of how we treat Israel and how we should be praying for them. If you do not know solid doctrine, if you do not know the signs of the end of the age, if you do not know what the original in scripture looks like, how will you test when the counterfeits come, claiming to be from the word of the living God? The Bible should act as our anchor or as our mooring 
uh, so that we're just not carried around wherever the, the tide wants to take us. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. Traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Um, the message of much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. The devil doesn't want people to be focused on what's to come. He wants us to be very much engaged with the things going on down here on earth. If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it's going to change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth until we fix everything down here, and that everybody's going to eventually get to heaven anyway, you can go ahead and take a very, very uh, uncommitted view of your Christianity. You can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. Our young people are not going to be reached through emergent gimmicks and techniques, through candles or labyrinths, through pizza parties, through chanting parties, through meditation techniques and yoga seminars. These young people aren't going to be reached because you are conforming the gospel to their culture, but because you are bringing the gospel to them in their culture and saying to them, the Lord is relevant for you today. For his gospel, his word of salvation, is what will bring you into that relationship with God without the use of gimmicks or occult techniques. What makes a Christian? not the church that you go to. It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? Hi guys, I can barely believe what I walked into in a Christian meeting a couple of weeks ago. And this is not the first time this has happened in a Christian church or organization here in Jerusalem. And I just despair at the deception, the counterfeit spirit, the uh, Kundalini evil that is coming in to our buildings and, you know, into the hearts of, of people who are perhaps striving to know God. But what's even more worrying is that there's no shepherds to look out for them. I'm going to show you the footage that I took when I walked into this meeting. And it, as you'll see, it's all about birthing. This Kundalini spirit is the most disturbing thing I have ever walked into, especially in a place that's Christian. So I show you this, you know, Please turn it off if it disturbs you because it's very disturbing, but this is demonic, this is evil, and I show you this to warn you to stay well away from this type of thing. It is not Christianity, it is the New Age Kundalini Antichrist spirit. TV. There's a great deception coming, folks. It's being drunk in the spirit. <laughs> 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 
These people are under the influence of a cruel form of hypnotism in which their psyche is broken down to leave them vulnerable to the power of suggestion and the manipulation of demonic spirits. This also seemed to have a specific goal into making them reenact the birthing process of a woman. <laughs> Oh, I sense a lot of angelic activity in the room tonight. <laughs> you know, the giving of birth is accompanied by celebration. <laughs> and I can't prove this to you, but I believe there are angels that come to watch when God's birth in the new The old boss, the old boss, the old the old boss, the old boss, the old won't work anymore. For you are doing a new thing. For you are doing a new thing. The Lord is doing a new thing. I can have a correction the spirit belongs. God, take us to that place. That place was not comfortable. That place was not predictable. That place where we don't have control. strange than not was that the this was just a few days after September the 23rd this year when all the people across the world were talking about this Revelation 12 sign and as you just heard the dragon not catching and devouring the babies that's a direct quotation from that passage and of course it includes that birthing this imitative magic it seems of corrupting these Christian people and making them enact through these familiar deceptive spirits this birthing action. Illuminized Freemasonry has adopted this picture of the first family of paganism as the formula by which they intend to produce their Masonic Christ or Antichrist on the world scene. Masons believe that the divine child, the Masonic Christ, will be conceived and born on the spiritual plane and that conception and delivery will be transferred to the physical plane. In fact, there was a number of desecrations that took place with the Mekadeshet festival uh, during this period of time in Jerusalem. It was it seemed like a sustained attack from the enemy. And what's worse is these young, influential people are caught right in the middle of it. Now, the basic question that we're asking in this documentary is, why are these manifestations so similar to Eastern religions and Hinduism and the Kundalini cults and yet they're not found in scripture, they're not found in the Bible, they're not found in classical Christianity at all. <laughs> now this all began with Rodney Howard Brown imparting a new anointing into a bunch of leaders and they spread it around the world. Kundalini spirit, which is a serpent spirit that has been brought into the Western culture or Western world through many Pentecostal preachers who, my friend, they, they are very charismatic. They have been hungry for power and it has opened them up to this fraudulent counterfeit which they attribute to being the Holy Spirit.
The Holy Spirit, my friend, is the mind of God. He is the communicator of heaven, and he does not make a fool out of you. He does not make a scene out of you. This, this, this is the, the, the channeling, the summoning of these uh, evil spirits, oftentimes is through music. Because why? Music sets the atmosphere and oftentimes people tend to relax and they empty themselves out. They, they really become more uh, vulnerable to being open to this demonic spirit. The Bible clearly teaches us, beloved, John said, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see if it be of God. Be vigilant, be sober, because you have an adversary and he mimics and counterfeits everything that is of God. And he started to laugh for half an hour. He couldn't control himself. Он не мог контролировать he себя. Laughed and laughed. Он просто смеялся there, и смеялся. There was no preaching. And he told us, this is a new move with the Holy Ghost. Это новое движение Святого Духа. Just laughing. Только смех. And he calls it a move of God. Let me ask you a question. Позвольте задать вам вопрос. The Holy Ghost who wrote this book, who said the truth sets you free, would he cause the minister to laugh so he cannot preach this word? It's crazy. Where's the spiritual discernment? Here's a man, and he's walking through the congregation, hissing at people like a snake. And they start wiggling on the floor like a snake. People down here barking. That's not what I read about my Jesus. I don't see altar calls. I don't see people weeping for sin. This deception stems from the pagan movements that the Holy Spirit is a female energy that will transcend all our restrictions, which is clearly the direct opposite of what the Bible actually says. And from this we understand that this counterfeit version of the Holy Spirit is just a ruse to cover the fact that what is really being summoned in these rituals is the goddess Diana or the Kabbalistic spirit of Sophia, Shekinah, the Kundalini spirit of enlightenment, Isis, and all of the above. What we are really talking about is Lucifer, the destroyer, the spirit of Antichrist. And that's why you see so many now idolizing this emotional, experiential, loose, unrestricted, boundaryless euphoria rather than the sound foundation of doctrine of God's word. It's a house that's being built on sinking sand, and the sheep are losing their boundary of protection as there are few strong shepherds willing to stand up to fight off this wolf. Now this is not an attack on women at all. Ladies have an important role in the body of Christ, but this is clearly an agenda. Remember, in order for that wicked woman Jezebel to rule, there must be no men to stand in her way.